Test, test. All right, uh, we're gonna go through and introduce ourselves. I'm Jay Ann Chaney, uh, founder and CEO of Variant Publications, sci-fi author. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Dakota Kraut. I am the owner and president of Mountaindale Press. I'm co-founder of Wolfpack Publishing. Um, we started in 2013. Uh, started selling books in 2010. Back when you, all you had to do was put them up and they sold. Test, Changed test, a little test. bit. I, I, Michael Anderley, LMBP in publishing. It's going. Especially when I say I created 20 books to 50K, because I just you know wanted to say that over these guys who are all friends of mine. <laughs> <laughs> think anyone in here knows who you are, Michael. Uh, probably not. Uh, all right, so we're going to go through this list of questions, and then if there's time, we'll take questions from the crowd. Uh, Dakota and Michael, uh, let's start with Dakota, and then we'll go to you. What made you go from being a writer to a publisher? I spent a lot of money learning how to do things right, and I realized, well, in, in a serious way, kind of like I, I tried to say that jokingly, but then it was just sad. Um, no, so... <laughs> I, <laughs> I, s I spent a lot of money uh, learning how to do things. You know, like I, I, would, I rapid released my first series, um, and then I learned how to rapid release series. I went back and I did editing, I did cover art, I did all this other stuff. I started going to conventions and taking courses and learning all of these different things, ads for authors, everything that I could get my hands on to learn, and all of a sudden I was $30,000 down. And I said, wow, with the way the markets change and, and the, the ways that uh, our genre is expanding and, and splitting into so many subcategories and subgenres, I can't keep up. I can't be in all of these things at all times. So if I'm not going to waste my investment, what do I do? And so uh, basically I, I hired my wife and uh, she, yeah. You know. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, you know, we, we did this together and uh, uh, put her in charge and now life is good, yeah. <laughs> I have to ask whether that was put her in charge or just accept the inevitable. Yes, the answer is yes. Drive and pay, Dakota, drive and pay. Um, I had intended to be a publisher the whole time, so we were a publisher of the first author myself, and it just so happened that uh, the, real, or the future allowed me to be the vision that I had hoped it would be. So I hadn't changed from desiring to be an author to a publisher. I was a publisher who was also an author. Mike Bray. I co-wrote one book. It was a painful experience. <laughs> I went in to be a publisher the whole time. I'm a numbers guy. This is my eighth or ninth company. Um, yeah, I'm just, a, I'm an operator. And we went in, into it with that in mind. But at the time we went into it, um, I started out with L.J. Martin and Cat Martin. So I had uh, a New York, New York Times best-selling author, and then I had a Midwest uh, Western author. And uh, the Western author would let me run in the gray area. The New York Times bestseller, the romance author, I was straight arrow. So I had the opportunity to do a lot of testing, 2009, 2010, when it was Amazon was, oh, some of it, we got in before Unlimited. So, again, there was a million and a half books up when I started. This next question, I'd like to start with you, Mike. What are the most challenging aspects of running a publisher? Labor. Um, we're always hiring. Um, we, uh, we like to work with people that are in love with the industry. Because that there, a lot of them use this as, as a stepping stone, and I know they did the same thing with Mike, and that's fine. If we can pay them, um, allow them to stay at home, give them a part-time job, and and give them the the time to write, that works out great. And uh, they may walk on eventually, but uh, we'll always be friends. Let me ask real quick, hey Mike, how easy is it to fire people? It's a bitch. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. I was, I was <laughs> what was the question? What are the most challenging <laughs> aspects of running a publisher? Uh, the most challenging aspects for me is getting outside my comfort zone. My comfort zone is creation, is ideation, is implementation of ideas related to business. But when it comes to talking to people and legal, I hate legal. I, I su highly suggest, uh, if your wife's a JD, to be careful with that. But I really do not like legal. And so when Judith wasn't part of the company, I was just making things that I felt was a, a good handshake, about as good as what we needed to do. We put it on paper. We moved forward. And legal so far has been the biggest issue with me as a publisher having to, gr um, to really wrap my head around that. What does it mean? What does it mean to own IP? What does it mean to do copyright? And I had some misunderstandings that I could not really get through. I think you know we tried to understand um, you know IP ownership copyright three times, both Judith and two lawyers, which were very expensive, before I got the real concern, which is, and I, I'll just phrase this real quick, my idea of IP ownership, I thought it was like stock. If you own 50%, you could veto something. No, 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 no. If you have, let's say, the person who finally got it through my head was, if you're in a band and the drummer owns 10% of something, the drummer can sell any of the rights with this so long as they give the 90% to the people who are owned. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> That's what really opened my eyes was the legal side. And so the legal for me is the thing that I think is uh, the most difficult. Uh, for me, it's actually staying in my lane. So I tend to be a scattered individual, uh, and that's actually by choice, right? Like I, I really like to, uh, when I'm when I'm going down something, like I'm, I'm writing a lot, I'm spending a lot of time doing something, I like to have a mental shift. Like I like to break away and do something else for a while while my brain recharges in, in this thing over here. So uh, when I'm putting out ideas and when I'm writing, um, at the, my, my mind, like the other half of my brain is like, hey man, you know what's cool is SOPs. And I'm like, yeah, those Which SOPs said, no are ever. cool. <laughs> um, and then I, you know, I, I get done with writing and I, I do SOPs and, and uh, I'm like, okay, or, or whatever it is. What is an SOP? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, SOP is a standard operating procedure. Right, so uh, for training people, for uh, you know, onboarding and all these other things, um, basically if I'm going to delegate something, they have to know how to do the job step by step in a, in a way that you know, is uh, usable and repeatable. Um, and so oftentimes what will happen is I will get it in my head that everyone is just on board with what I'm doing. <laughs> that was my wife, you didn't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And uh, so I'll say, hey, we talked about this that one time, and I have it all done in a document, and it's live. And then you know, all of the other staff and, and financial advisors and everyone else is like, but why? <laughs> well, I was bored. I was, I, I, I was doing what I was supposed to do, right? And like, now you're supposed to write. You're supposed to sit down and write. Okay. So staying in my lane and staying focused is kind of the harder part for me. It's full circle. So uh, I'd like to start down here for this next one and just work our way this way. Uh, but we have three very unique kinds of publishers up here. And uh, I'd like to start with Michael and ask, what sets your publisher apart? Like, what makes you unique, LNBPN? Probably from the fact that uh, what makes us unique is we are very aggressive on how fast we can get books created, you know, the creation. And we're, uh, we have scaled up massively. You know, usually, typically, a, a smaller publisher will do 12 to 24 books a year. A mid less, um, even you know, to, to some of the publishers that are well known, maybe do 96 books a year. We're at 300 plus, and so you know, we're looking at that, and that's what we're doing now. But I just you know asked Robin Cutler last couple of weeks ago, hey, I need to add another publishing aspect to this. We need another 100 books next year. And so it's our ability to scale and to be able to run those through our systems effectively and get a quality product out the other side. Across several genres, yeah. We're, we're, we're slutty that way. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Mike? We, uh, we're also a high volume publisher, two to eight books a week, or four to eight a week. Two Westerns every single week. All right, I'm going to add here that he takes a lot of backlist. That's all not created yeah. work. Yeah, and, and that's it. We started as a backlist publisher. Um, my partner at the time, L.J. Martin, 
had 30 plus years in, in uh, writing westerns, had worked with every house in New York. His wife, Cat Martin, uh, same thing. She'd 78 books, 22 times on New York bestsellers list. So we modeled our company after traditional publishers with the exception of doing the print on demand. Yeah, I just want to add to that really quick. The reason I stated what I did is Mike dissed me two years ago, two and a half years ago. But you know what happened? The way that he did it was such a way that it caused me to be so intrigued in what you said that we, had, that we ended up having lunch together. And uh, now he's one of my best friends. And so I, I just want to clarify that when, when I'm thinking about that. It's like I'm dissing him as a friend. <laughs> but do you have a pillow? Okay, the other person who dissed me this week was frickin' Dakota Kraut. <laughs> I ended up having, because of Craig's travel across America, I ended up having an opportunity to be at, um, at Dakota's house on September 12th, and we took one of those pictures together, right? Well, he put it on a pillow. <laughs> and so now I have a pillow that's this 14 by 14 inch with Dakota and me, it's got a little heart on it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I play the long jokes. Um, uh, for myself, I would say that uh, we have a really good blend uh, for, for Mountain Dale Press. We have a really good blend of uh, really careful crafting of books combined with more rapid release, right? Um, and so our process just really works to get that author to hand the book over so that they can get out of the way, right? <laughs> And so, um, you know, th they uh, get to approve all changes and everything, but they, it goes through and, and we make sure that we have a lot of people in our genre that are really focused and, and, you know, paid to do this, coming through and making sure that the book that we're putting out is the best quality for the genre at the time we're putting it out. So um, we have hard deadlines because we have to be fast enough to hit those trends as they're, f as they're hot. Um, and I, I can say that at least half of our authors, because of this, are, if not at, they're very, very close to six figures each. If you, could, if you could summarize, and we'll start with Mike again. If you could, uh, Michael, sorry. <laughs> We've got two mics up here. Uh, if you could summarize in maybe like the one bullet point line, the best possible advice for somebody that was getting into starting a publisher or running a publisher, um, what would that advice be? Oh, man, I wish <laughs> I could put it first. <laughs> <laughs> the best possible advice on Going being... Going big bank account. Okay, yeah, all right. I'm not going to steal your thunder, but that's a, a very accurate one. I mean, to be well-funded is beneficial, to really know who is your target market and how are you going to market to them, because once it's not you as the actual author themselves, and the readership will give it if you put your name alongside of it, some of it, but how do you sell an unknown person? How do you create a market for them if there is none? And you know, do you have that capability to do it? Because as a publisher, that's really your job. Anybody can create a quality, not the story, but anyone can find the people and the resources to give you a good edit, to give you a, a, a genre-specific cover, you do need to, you know, clarify, but in able to sell it, that's your job. Mike? One line? <laughs> <laughs> I missed that part. <laughs> One point. One point is uh, the easiest way to sell your last book is with your next book. Um, we very seldom take standalones, and we work with some big names. Um, we're all, all about series, and I'm sure everybody here is. Uh, I would say start slow, right? So you have all of the time in the world to get bigger, right? But if you can't manage the people that you bring on, you're just going to fail, right? It's just going to go under. Um, my, my company started with three people, and that might have been too much for us at the start, right? Just having to deal with personalities and understand what that looks like, having to deal with, um, you know, a lot of our systems were ad hoc at the time. You know, they were not optimized systems. They were not even well-managed systems in some cases. And um, putting your system through the stress test of one person at a time, 
maybe two people, whatever it is, and figuring out where those flaws are and, and how, to, how to make your weaknesses much stronger. I, I think that's a very important thing that a lot of people th forget. It's not about short-term cash grab. It's about long-term success. All right, we're gonna start with Dakota here next. This is my final question, then we're gonna take questions from you guys. Where do you see the industry going in the next five years in regards to both writers and publishers, indie publishers specifically? Um, I would say that the history of sales is a very cyclical thing, right? So um, what happens, oh, what, not even two decades ago now is large publishing houses kind of disappeared. You know, there were 11 major publishing houses and now we're down to like, I think they call them the big four, right? Big four, big, big, was the big five not too long ago, was it? Yeah. Still the big five. <laughs> um, and. Yeah, they haven't finished the deal. Oh, okay, yeah, there's a deal in the works. But yeah, they know about um, And so what we see is, you know, in really 2000 and, what was it, 2001 or what, 2011? 2011, 2011 uh, KU became a thing. And, and so all of a sudden, you know, uh, becoming a self published author became viable and you were able to get your book out there and make money and people ran with that. And, and so it, it swept the market into an entirely new direction. So we saw, you know, this is a baby industry. We're 10 years in to a brand new industry essentially. And I think it's just gonna uh, continue on like this. Uh, small uh, uh, self-published authors are going to collect into independent publishing houses, small publishing houses, and those will get larger and larger and eventually People will be like, hey, they're too huge, they're too bloated, whatever it is, and they'll be like, well, I'm going to self-publish. And then a whole bunch of people are going to self-publish a whole new market, and then they're going to be like, man, this is hard because everything is oversaturated, and then they're going to collect into indie publishing houses, and those are going to start getting bigger, so on and so forth. So that's kind of what I see is the, the cyclical nature of um, sales. Again, I've been in it for a little bit. Um, the one thing that I think the consolidation is going to continue, um, we've been, my company's been approached a couple times by pretty big companies. The, uh, the first two companies to, to come into this digital platform were Rosetta and Open Road. Both of those companies were extremely well funded, um, both of venture capital. Uh, the next breed, they come in, it's actually these guys, these sharp, sharp kids that figured out their own models on their own. Um, you know, so old guys that just copied that old model, they're kicking our ass. Uh, he's actually inaccurate. He's downplaying himself. Don't let him sandbag you. Significant. Whatever you do. Um, you know, the, both of the gentlemen, Dakota and Mike, have spoken to something that has been on my mind a lot, so I'm going to let that and talk to something else, and that's going to be the, the next generation. We're talking a little bit farther out, the audio, the video, the things that are going on there. So some of the things LMBPN has been doing for a few years is we've been messing with 3D models, not just for the covers, which is where you obviously would have seen us do it first, but the acquisition of the models and the assets that are required to do the covers themselves because our intention is actually to be inside Unreal Engine and be in, using XN suits and things like that to where the models themselves and the ability to do the marketing is going to be the same model that's on the cover of our book is going to be the one that's going to be doing the advertising. It's going to be the one that's going to connect with UNLV and the actors and everything else because we're moving into the audio video space ourselves. That's the intention of where we intend to go. Cool. All right. Well, uh, we tried to get through that quickly so that we could take questions. How are we doing on time? Good. Probably pretty good. Yeah, 25 minutes. Okay. I got a few more questions here in case we run out from the audience. So does anybody have anything? Any questions they want to ask Michael or Dakota or Mike? Oh, yeah, there's a mic back there. Hi, uh, two-part question, if that's okay. First, and Michael, you were just touching on it, how important are audiobooks to each of your businesses? And for those of you who do actually use those, uh, how do you get them produced? Do you go to an established audiobook publishing house or do you do it direct contact with narrators? 
We started with audio, and I like to call it a tax avoidance strategy. Um, and the reason, <laughs> because the marketing of audiobooks is vastly different than the marketing of ebooks. And so we had some, we struggled in the beginning with the marketing of what was going on with our audiobooks. And so our ROI on ebooks, 30 days, 90 days on the outside, anything longer than that was really a problem. So in the genres I'm in, you know, we would see everything from a Cure Theory and Gambit might be 30 days, but some of the other ones were like, you know, one and a half years, an ROI. And so when it looked at it from a standpoint of that way, it made a lot more sense just to stay in our lane and license it out. And so we built catalogs with Judith and everyone else that, you know, we now promote all of our audiobooks for licensing. And so we've, you know, done probably seven figures in that arena with as many books, but we still have 500 books in the back where either neither us nor our partners have done. So we're looking in all areas related to audiobooks. I'm gonna go next. <laughs> uh, so I can tell you that uh, for my company, audio is over 60% of our revenue, right? So um, more people are, well, I wouldn't say more people are reading or listening than reading, but we get higher returns from our um, audio than we do from anything else. And so what we do though is we contract that with narrators directly, right? So we, we go out there and we find narrators or they find us um, and we put together um, a contract between us for a series and we work together as much as we can if, and if we love what we do, then we continue on with more series and so on and so forth. Um, so the production is all with them and uh, with them, and then we also have um, uh, uh, audio engineers and so on and so forth that, that then those raw files come to, and we make sure that we're putting out the highest possible quality on all of the stuff. So it's not, I, wouldn't, I would not say it's easy to do, but it is doable. No, so we, uh, what we do is, uh, so uh, the, the question was, does it come from the narrator like recorder. full record, no. So uh, we, we contract the books with the authors, right? So the author comes in and, and says, hey, um, I want to publish with you. So if we're publishing them, usually we're, we're doing their eBooks, paperbacks, uh, hardcovers, audiobooks. And so uh, once it gets through our audit, uh, editing process, it's just the next step in the pipeline for us is having it in the hands of the narrator. So we, we schedule these months and months and months in advance. And, and so that's why our uh, deadlines are so hard, right? So. Uh, no, no. So we, we send that, uh, so we do not have our own studio. We send that script to the narrators, and the narrators will rec uh, record it, give us the raw files back. Uh, we then send it to our audio engineering team. Right. Perfect. Uh, we have a question. We have a question. We have a question for JN from Facebook. Uh, oh, okay. Would, would you mind sharing Variant Publishing's website? They can't <coughs> find it. Um, we actually don't have a website specific to the publishing company. Um, yeah, you can just go to jandchaney.com or you can contact me directly through Facebook. I run a very different model from these guys. Uh, so I do a lot of collaborations and uh, I don't publish other people separately. It's usually, it, I'm very involved in the process. So that's why I said we have very different models up here. Would, would you call your model a variant? I would. Hey. A variant model. <laughs> Pretty punny. Pretty punny. What's the question? The audio. Yeah, we'll back the audio. in audio. We had followed Mike's, Mr. Anderley's model for a minute, started selling rights, then you started pulling them in-house. Now we're doing more, and, and again, the Western genre doesn't move like some other um, genres and audio, but uh, we're doing more in-house, and then part of it's for tax reasons. Um, a lot of it's for tax reasons, just pushing an income <laughs> off. But otherwise, would you just be selling rights? Questions? Did you say yours was a two-parter? Oh, oh, okay. Question in the back. Do you, you want to take this one? This one works, that one doesn't. Yeah, we can share. Yeah. We have the mic for the mics. <laughs> Hi, so 
I started um, City Owl Press in 2014, and we had our five-year model that we hit in three and a half years. We rewrote our model, and now we're at the point where we're scaling up again from 40 to 50 titles a year to 70 to 100. Um, thank you. I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, how do you prepare for that next phase, that next scale up in your business? Can you, can you? I mean, here, here. here. <laughs> yeah, can we repeat the question? I didn't catch. How do you scale up? Yeah. So the long story short is um, how do you scale your business when you're taking it from what we're doing right now, which is around 40 to 50 titles a year to 70 to 100 titles a year? How do you prepare for the next Yeah, next I'm, sure the, I'm sure the two mics can speak to that. <laughs> I'll let your mic back, Mike. Um, the way we did, we the Western genre is obviously a, a smaller niche. Um, we when we went into it, we only had one bigger um, competitor, Kensington, and that was off of one brand, William Johnstone. We saturated that market again, uh, releasing two westerns a week. Uh, it just couldn't handle it. The way we topped it and um, when we went from a million to two million was by expanding genres. Um, the first next genre we went into after Wesson's was men's adventure, um, the action adventure. And we're doing really well there. But again, we're a backless publisher. Um, we, we have uh, Harold Robbins. We have 18 of his titles. Um, I know out of, uh, we have 164 authors and I think 38 of them are dead. How did you scale, specifically scale? <laughs> the, no, well, I'm not sure what's going on, but when you scaled, did you have to actually take this from, you know, from two a week? You're now at eight a week. Yeah. That's hellacious. What were the, how did you do that? Yeah, I mean, we, um, we, I almost killed a couple of girls, but. Uh, <laughs> it's not a murder mystery. <laughs> but uh, with, uh, and uh, we're also unique in that we have in-house staff. Typically for the small publishers, everything's outsourced. And it's, um, it takes a brilliant person to manage outsourcing. You're working with 50, 60, 70 people, managing a ton of deadlines. We've eliminated some of the hassle by, by hiring people with in-house employees. And uh, we don't have we don't have the editing crap these guys go through with our backlist. We have a, we, <coughs> we just go out and buy a, find used paperbacks. These guys, these things were written on typewriters, you know. <laughs> but we find a used paperback, scan it, and then we don't have to go through an edit. It's been edited professionally in New York. All we have to do is a proofread, um, just clean up the scanning errors. We can do those. We can outsource that for 50 bucks a book. So that's one of the keys to, um, to our success. We can put books out as fast as they can, but they've got editors behind it, and they've got JIT teams behind it. They've got a lot of people that uh, doing the work that was done 20 or 30 years ago in New York that we're taking advantage of. Dakota, can you uh, add to that? Sure. Um, so, uh, some actionable steps that you can look at. Um, so, when you're scaling up, one of the big things that you want to look at is uh, something online called the process maturity model. Okay, and so the pr uh, pr uh, a lot of this is small business, just small business, right? Uh, selling books is, or writing books is definitely an art. Selling books is business, right? Um, so, there's going to be a lot of business uh, practices that can really cross into almost any industry. And, and one of those is the, uh, like I said, the process maturity model. So when you first start with something, like when you're testing out, it's called ad hoc, right? It's something that you're just kind of throwing together and, and hoping that bootstrap and it is going to work, right? Um, and as that grows in maturity and it becomes well, uh, well managed uh, and to finally it becomes optimized, right? When you can clearly tell someone, like, have you ever heard of the, um, uh, if you can teach someone else, you know it yourself? Right? If you can put it down in an SOP, so a standard operating procedure, if you can step-by-step step go through, add pictures, do whatever it takes to make sure that your team can move through as quickly as possible 
um, to hit all of the points that you need. Um, and so you, you, uh, that will put you up to, uh, that will put it up to a well-managed thing because you, you know, it's well-managed. Once they know how to do it and they can make variants of it and, and do it well because they know it so well, um, then you have an optimized model. Like if, if it's very follow, like something that you can do over and over, repeatable, it's great. So what I would say is go through and take a hard look at your process and figure out where you know what you're doing. Right, but if you're the single point of failure for that, there's a good chance that that model fails when it is stress test. So that's that's all I can say about that. And and uh, I would say Katie Cross is, in my mind, the queen of SOPs. Um, so if you if you have questions on that, I, I would love to tell you all about it. I, I think she is also a really great resource for this. Yeah, I I, I want to, I'm thinking about all of this because I, I do know these gentlemen, and when I grow up, I want to be each one of them. Um, <laughs> The, a little bit different that we did in LMVPN, or at least I, that uh, I did, is when I found the individual that was going to, for instance, editing, Lynn Stigler, I didn't ask her, can I hire you? I didn't ask her, could I outsource to you? I said, could you build a company that would be connected with LMVPN so that we can give all of our editing to you? And that's actually what we did with both editing and some other things that we did. We actually created a new model. It's very similar to Home Depot back in the day. When Home Depot came in and said, hey, we need, you're gonna need you know, 100,000 gallons of paint, they would actually come and invest in companies and grow that company, not necessarily take them over. And so that was a very similar model to what I've used to, to actually ask individuals, look, you know, we have a lot of need, but I'm gonna need a company that's capable of doing it. Are you willing in, to invest and create your company alongside us? We've talked a lot about investing in your own company up here. You guys talked about it earlier. <clears throat> that was one of the questions I actually had for you, was how much and how expensive was it to build this thing, this machine that you have? Um, I don't know about you guys, but for the first three to four years, I didn't take a salary. It just all went, I paid my bills, obviously. You know, can't live on the street and run this. But I didn't take uh, any profit. And so how was it for you guys? Did you go through a similar experience uh, and you know what if you could estimate was the you know final tally on all that to get it to where you were satisfied with it I know you're probably n you're still not satisfied with it because you're a very ambitious guy <laughs> But you know, you know what I mean yeah. estimates yeah, You know, start with my satisfaction To where it, I, it's a song by the Rolling Stones. <laughs> I guess to, to where it yeah, was I, uh, I've never had a content breath in my life, yeah. but um, Yeah, I don't where do you stop? We, uh, and I have no idea how much we invested. We did bootstrap into this. Um, we, uh, I overspent advertising a few times. I had to go to Cat Martin and bail us out twice. We ran a lot of red lights in the early days. Um, you know, before KU, we were, had our accounts closed three times. Um, after KU, we lost uh, pre-order rights for a year. Um, we made a bunch of mistakes. Luckily, uh, at the time um, when all this was going on, the guy in, in charge of uh, Kindle Unlimited was a guy named Dan Slater, um, an old Western editor from Bantam. And uh, he'd bought several books from, from my partner so he, every time we got in trouble running red lights, he fixed it for us. <laughs> he unfortunately moved up to AW, so I don't have that luxury anymore. Sure. Um, I have some, I'm gonna give, just give a ballpark, but it's pretty, pretty close because my wife confirmed it there for me. Um, so uh, f we started our company in uh, 2018, right, Mountain Dale Press. Um, and what we did, we took no investors except for myself, right? Um, and as of uh, this year, we are running completely in the in the black, right? And uh, what that means, though, is that I had to pay back the loans to myself with interest or else the IRS would come after me, right? Um, and so what we did was uh, we had about $350,000 from uh, the start till now that I invested in the company is now back with us and uh, at this point are able to draw salary. So it, about three hundred fifty thousand dollars over two years um, is is what I would say it took up for us to this point. Yeah, it's a little bit of a, a odd question for me to try to answer because it, it was never 
month 12, month 13, I was doing $100,000 a month. And so, so obviously everything is self-funded, but that number of what it took to grow over here is probably in the range of five to seven million to where we're at now and with a constant push uh, to continue pushing forward with this. So we're, we're investing heavily six figures a month in the continued growth of LMBPN. Yeah, I'd say for me, it's in the seven figure range at this point after seven years of publishing. So it, it gets expensive. Um, any more questions from the crowd? Uh, given all those expenditures at the beginning, um, I, I've seen some uh, companies, particularly those that do periodicals and uh, anthologies or gaming, uh, use Kickstarter for a lot of their products. What do you guys see as the future of things like crowdfunding uh, for small press publishing? I think I think there's a lot of value in that. Uh, you have to pick your model and stick to it. You know, find out what works for you. Uh, I know people that do direct on their website. They have tremendous success. Other people try it and fail abysmally. You know, some people find a lot of success with KU. Uh, other people surprisingly make a lot of money on paperbacks and that becomes their primary business strategy which is for most of us unheard of but people make that work you find what works for your genre and your audience you build that loyalty and uh you know they feel that they feel that connection with you as the author um and they stick around and you want to build that community as much as you can um, and just make it bigger and bigger Start down there. <laughs> um, I, mm, no, please, go ahead and take it, because I, I just lost you my go? <laughs> Can you repeat the question one more time? So basically what crowdsourcing like, right? So you're looking at what what's, uh, what does the future of crowdsourcing look like for starting companies? Uh, I have concerns. Um, so mainly, one of my concerns is the legality of it, right? So if you are um, essentially getting a large source of investors, and telling them that you're, this is what you're going to do with it. Are they actually buying stock in your company, right? Are, is that something that's happening? And, and that is something that I have seen come up in court cases, and I don't know how those are resolved, right? Um, and so with, with crowdsourcing, I would say it's harder to say um, because I know that for myself, I used my success as an author, right? And my c current continued, thank you, God, uh, continued success as an author um, to fund what I do and fund other people's projects knowing that it was a risk to my personal finances. So when it comes to how am I going to crowdsource, it, it never really crossed my mind like of, of taking funds that someone gave me for starting um, like a, a company by itself. I, I used my, like I said, I used my personal funds to f roll that into making a company. I, I don't know how that would work and, but it's something to look into, perhaps. So the people that I've seen have a lot of success, like in the 80, 90, $100,000 range on Kickstarter with a book, you know, usually paired with an audio book or something. Um, those guys tended to have, to already had audiences, you know, like massive audiences. Um, yeah, you know, and they had to make that transition for whatever reason, they got banned or whatever from Amazon in some cases. When you do that, you're asking a lot of those readers to make that jump because they're so locked into that Kindle Unlimited ecosystem. And that's what I was saying before about the community. If you have that, the strength of that community, they will follow you into, <laughs> into the fires of hell. Uh, but without that, it's really hard because you're, you, know, you have to spend all that money on ads. You have to get all that attention, all those eyes. You have to, some people go out and hire a marketing firm just to get that Kickstarter off the ground, and now you're giving 40 30% of, of the money you make to that firm on top of the money you're paying to Kickstarter. So it gets very expensive. And then it's like, well, why didn't you just go through Amazon and get your 70%? So there's a lot of factors involved from that, and a lot of trust is being lost because of the reasons he gave among readers and um, you know patrons and stuff uh, for these other websites because people don't deliver on the work. And when they do deliver, it's not a good product in some cases. We, I'm like Dakota, uh, crowdfunding never crossed my mind. However, we've offered several books off for film and, th and TV, theater. 
Well, one of the movie deals we got going now, they gave us or gave the author a small option with the contract behind it if, and the right to exercise that option in 12 months. They, uh, the company bought this, exercised their right, 360 grand a couple of weeks ago, and that was all crowdfunded. They started out with asking for a million and raised a million eight. Peter, do you want to go, Michael? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, there's certain aspects of it. If I was going to do it, um, for instance, audio. Audio is very expensive ROI for us because of the marketing efforts and everything else take a long time. It is something that we're willing to look into to actually crowdfund the audio and then pay, you know, pair it with a hardback book. But, you know, I'm going to insert and it's going to have a person responsible for doing it. It's not going to be a core part of our process. And, you know, since we, we strive to be someone who produces a lot of books, we have to say no to a lot of things that make sense for the smaller publisher who's doing 12, 24. You can really get involved in that. And so in comics, it's pretty much, I know Mike and I have talked about it a lot, comics is almost universally, if you come off the indie, or into the indie sphere, is driven off of Kickstarter. And so there's a lot of value in that. Um, so we are, we are willing to totally look at that and, and to do it, but it has to be something that I feel can scale. And so for us, that's a, a delineating factor. We had a question back here a minute ago. Someone was uh, jumping up and down. It had to do with hiring. What was that? It had to do with hiring. Um, Mike, you mentioned that you're always trying to find people and labor is the problem. So do you have like a top three roles you try to fill routinely? Roles, <laughs> top three roles, roles you're hiring oh, that for. that we're hiring? Yes. Um, we're always hiring formatters, editors. Um, we want, uh, we uh, just purchased a new imprint a couple months ago. We're um, looking to just staff that imprint up to stand alone. Um, just about every role out there we're looking for people. Um, I don't know if she's back there, our CEO, would be happy to hand you a business card. <laughs> sure. Um, one of the things that we're, I mean, almost like anyone else, you know, um, so I'm a, I'm a rather creative mind in what I do. And the, so I see big picture, I see grand sequences, I see all this stuff, but details elude me. And so typically when I'm looking for someone, I, I'm looking for someone who is opposite of me. You know, I'm looking for someone who is, um, <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing. Uh, who is analytical, who is uh, going to watch those small details. So I'm almost always looking for really good editors. And when I find them, they're going to have to pry them out of my cold, dead hands, right? Um, so uh, whether it's line editors, developmental editors, um, uh, copy editors, I'm always looking for good editors. Um, artists is another thing because finding uh, an artist, you have a, a really pretty triangle where you have delivers on time, really great art, and price point and you can pick two essentially and and so you know finding really high quality author, uh, artists uh, is always something that I'm, I'm looking for um, because we like to collect butterflies right I mean as long as we have them there and we, and we can see them and, and they're doing stuff great but if they vanish it's like where did they go right so uh, so basically those two big roles of uh, editing and uh, art are always in high demand Ah, uh, the usual, I think. Artists and editors. Oh, that was long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, one of the things that I try to do is make sure that whenever we're hiring somebody, it's, we have the opportunity to keep them around. And when we do something like art, you know, we're going to um, be implementing for a long time because it creates your brand. And so you have to have find someone who's be willing to be stick with you. So. In the artist vein, we've got art now where people can say that's a, an LMBPM book because it, they know it's within one of the cadre, cadre of the five different artists that we use religiously. And, it, and you know we back them. Editing, once again, that became an outsourced company, if you will, to someone else. And so the, while we have discussions, that's their own company. We don't hire those editors. However, they edit to our specifications. And so when it looks at from a, um, I have to admit that one of the things I fear at night is that I grow the company too large, we fail to hit payroll, and I've got to let people go. So I go a lot slower than perhaps I could, and I hesitate to bring anyone that's into our sphere that would be considered um, someone we pay 
and then no, not be able to pay them in six months. Yeah, I actually have seven full-time staff members. Uh, they're all on salary, and several of them are here in the crowd now. My art director's right there, and our project manager. Um, once you have a system that works, and you have a team that you can rely on uh, consistently, and they, they consistently deliver, you, you know, if you're comfortable, you don't really want to keep hiring and expanding and bloating your company. You want to do what works. And uh, once you get that streamlined enough, and you want to grow it a little bit, and you have some money in the bank, then expand. But